Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents, God's Church of Love, every Saturday and Tuesday. And we are bringing the word from 2 Samuel chapter 6, and we're touching on 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, what I want to bring to you is you have to understand that there are many, many reasons why many people have it find it extremely difficult becoming intimate with God. And your intimacy with God is foundational to your walk with God. Your intimacy with God is foundational to your obedience to God. Your intimacy with God is your foundation to wisdom and understanding. All right. Now, and your ability to trust God him. All right. Now, some people, they find it very difficult because the way they were raised, many have a background where there was very little affection, very little affirmation, very little, if any, approval, very little teaching and time taking and all of that very little nurturing, but a whole lot of rejection, a whole lot of criticism, a whole lot of intolerance, a whole lot of stuff can really make it difficult to trust a God that you're trying to be intimate with and you know pretty much nothing about other than what you read and what you've heard. All right. So what I want to share the Lord gave me a store, a couple of stories in the Bible, and I didn't even know where these were. I knew they were in the Old Testament, but the Lord directed me right to them. They just happened to be in the same book. And it is 2 Samuel, so turn with me to that, because I want you to hear what happened. 2 Samuel chapter 6 deals with... David. Now, I remember years ago, I heard a sermon and the pastor was talking about how he tends to be controlling. This was him. This is what came to my mind when I was getting ready for this. Because he tends to be controlling, he's pretty transparent, but because he tends to be controlling, he shared a dream with us. Check this out. He shared a dream. He had emotional issues, emotional scars, a lot of, you know, hangups. And he acknowledged them, but he was still processing through them. And he shared a number of dreams he had where God was showing him that it was not easy for him to open up. Now, in this lecture of his, he shared that God would give him dreams where he would be standing out with a whole bunch of people and he was fully clothed and everything and he was talking to this one, that one, and that would be happening or they'd be at a picnic or whatever, different scenarios. And then all of a sudden he'd look down and he's butt naked, no clothes on. And he said, you should see the what I went through trying to cover myself up. I was scrambling over here, covering up, scrambling over there, covering up trying to make sure nobody could, I, he said, I couldn't handle that happening to me. I was in such a panic mode. <laughs> he said, God is showing me through those dreams that I tend to have to be in control. There are certain things that are for me to know and for nobody else to find out. And he knew it. He acknowledged it publicly. Now, this is what I want to share with you. Some of you can't open up to other people. Either you don't want to deal with the pain. The subject is uncomfortable for you to address. Some of you are burdened and bound with shame and humiliation. Some of you are embarrassed for things other people did to you. You've been victimized. 
You've been rejected. You've been made fun of. But you internalize it and you're ashamed, riddled with shame and embarrassment. You feel like a walking apology, but you don't want to talk about it. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to remember it. That, no, 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 no. I don't want to deal with that subject. No. Well, there's a reason for that. And Andrea just talked about a man that they were ministering to that you could tell he had all his walls up like the walls of Jericho. Well, listen, the Lord gave me this analogy. This, this cracked me up when he gave it to me. Stay on the scripture. We're getting ready to get to it. I'm sitting in my house. Now, every morning, it's like a little ritual. Every morning, just because it's hot, 105, 107 degrees. It cools off around 12 midnight. So I open up my window. I open up my sliding glass door upstairs in my bedroom to my terrace. I open up the window in my bedroom as well so we get a little cross breeze going on. However, I don't open up my downstairs sliding glass window, my sliding glass door. Why? Ah, here's the clincher. I don't leave my front door open unless I'm standing there guarding it. Why? All right, here we go. This is the way we are with God. We don't want any flies in our ointment. And that's what you're afraid of when you open up. That's why you can't get close to God. If I don't stand and guard my sliding glass door, which has no screen on it, rodents can crawl right on in. Moths can fly in. Mosquitoes galore. And flies. I don't want any of them in my house. We also have big water bugs that are notorious for this region. I don't want them in my house either. So, sometimes you don't open up to God because you're afraid when you open up to God, there's going to be a fly in the ointment and God's going to disappoint you and you don't want to experience it. So you just don't deal with stuff and that way you don't get hurt. You don't get disappointed. You don't get intimidated. You don't lose your faith because he did something you didn't like. Now let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. I want you to know God understands this. And that's why he led me to these scriptures. I was like, Lord, I couldn't have thought of a better example. Now, <laughs> wow. Here we go. David just got the victory with the Philistines in chapter five. He got the victory now. They were able to recover the Ark of the Covenant. Listen to this. Listen to the details going on, the dynamics in this story. He got the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Everybody was instructed by God. Nobody touches the ark except the priest. They were the only ones allowed to touch, handle, or carry the ark. The only ones. No one else was to touch it. All right. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went in with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. On the ark of the covenant, there are, of the covenant, there are cherubims on each side. That's what they're talking about. Okay. And they sat the ark of, the, of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abimenad, that was in Gabeah, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gabeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Io 
went before the ark. He was up front. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord in all manner of instruments made of fur, even on the harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and cymbals. For those of you churches who believe that instruments should not be part of worship, check this out. Moving right along. And when they came to Natron's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and he took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The, the cart was shaken by the oxen. Didn't mean the ark was falling, but he put his hand out to protect it from falling, right? All right. Now, David is all excited, right? Because God restored the ark to the people, but his feathers droop in an instant. There's a fly in the ointment. What happened? The God he trusted did something he did not approve of, and most of us wouldn't either. Listen, verse six, verse seven, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there and his error, for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Whoa, is that called? He called himself trying to help, right? Like anybody would. But they were instructed in advance, do not touch it. Only the priests were allowed to. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perizuzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. That scared the bubble out of him, y'all. And said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Huh? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. <laughs> he said, I ain't going to die. Mm -mm. And it was told David saying, the Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Let me share this real quick. It's coming to me hot off the press. Some of you guys been walking with the Lord for years, some decades, and something happens in your life. God handles you in a way you don't like. God handles a family member in a way you don't think is faithful. And you put God aside somewhere else. I'm laying you aside for the time being, baby. Yeah. I don't believe you did that. I don't believe you allowed that as hard as I pray. I don't believe you let my mama die. I don't believe you let my best friend die from that disease. I don't believe it. I fasted and prayed. I was faithful to you. I served you for years in the heat of the day. And that's how you do me. That's how you repay me. They forget all the other blessings they got from the Lord. But right now, they're mad. Well, guess what? That's what David was going through. How dare he? The man was trying to help. What the heck is that about? You going to kill him for that? But check it out. What the Lord showed me. Man judges the outward appearance. But God, in all his sovereignty and wisdom, judges the heart. We don't know. David didn't know what was in Uzzah's heart. But what the Lord brought to my mind, I'm explaining something. Sometimes God will allow himself to be explained. The Lord brought to my memory a movie I watched about a Christian church. Listen to this. You got to hear this because you don't always know what's in a person's heart. And the word that the Lord put in my mind when I was remembering this church was arrogance. The man was not legally able or legally allowed to touch the ark, right? He called himself trying to help. What he did was exactly what this preacher did. This church had a church staff. I'm trying to paint these pictures so you really get it. 
God gives me the pictures. I know he wants me to use them. I haven't watched this movie in years. This pastor is in the middle of preaching while his pastoral staff sits up on the pulpit. He's preaching in the middle of a sermon. Some of the folks are yawning. He's an older man like me, right? Some of the folks are yawning. Some are falling asleep like Peter and Rashad. You know, they snoring through the message. But it's okay. I don't want to get my feelings hurt. Anyway, I'm messing with him. <clears throat> this guy, this, this young upstart, decides he wants to liven up things. So he takes it on himself, uninvited, check it out, and bulldozes his way from his chair to the pulpit while the man's in the middle of a sermon. And he covers the mic and he says, Good message, try you guys. You give the Lord praise. And he basically marches the man over and sits his behind down while he's looking at him like, what are you doing? And he goes up to the mic. Well, Lord, we're going to have church today. We're going to have church today, choir. Yeah, we're going to have church. He ain't saying jack. But he wants to liven up everybody with his phenomenalism. Because he's so arrogant, he thinks he's all that and 10 bags of chips. And God brought that to my mind. It showed me there may have been something like that. I'm not saying it was because I wasn't there. But for God to bring that to my mind, that to me can be the only reason for God to get angry when a person's trying to help. Because the man might have had that same type of arrogance here. <laughs> Let me handle this. Instead of saying, priest, get over here and, and steady the wagon. No, he could have steadied the wagon. He didn't have to touch the ark, but he grabbed whole of the ark. And it could have been a brazen act. No, and, and David didn't know his heart. David wasn't God, but David was upset when that man dropped in. So he didn't want no parts of the, of the ark. He didn't want no parts of it. And a lot of you don't want, I'm saying it in bad English. You don't want no, pap, I mean, triple negative. You don't want no part of God right now. How do you expect to trust him when he does you like that? Now, what happens? <clears throat> he goes on fast forward and he gets word that the man who, who's got uh, Obed Edom, who's got that ark sitting in his house. Their family is having their socks, I mean, their, the, God is blessing their socks off. They're blessed on the right, blessed on the right, blessed coming in, blessed going out, right, left, in and out, up and down. They're just blessed all around. And David's like, hmm. So he sends the priest to recover the ark. They recover the ark, they bring it into the city, and the city is blessed. Now, I say that to say this. A lot of you have laid God aside, and you built your wall, and you've drawn a line in the sand. And it's as if you're saying, I'll come out to you when I need you. But my door is not open for you to come and go as you please because I don't know what the heck you're going to do. And I don't know if I trust you that much. See, people who have that experience like that, they've never experienced God's love. There are times when God will do something that will blow your mind, that will make you do a double take. But if you have experienced the love of God, you will still choose to trust him because if you don't know anything else, you know God loves you. That's foundational right there. Now, let me share this real quick. Years ago, the Lord had warned me all day long not to drive. I wasn't picking up on the signal. I just thought there was an assignment against me and I'm just going to take authority over that assignment, cancel that bad boy, and I'm done. Yeah, well, that same day, I my car got totaled. And of course, God did not allow me to get hurt, but the car got totaled. And I was going to get the car insured the very next day. Check that out. 
Mm -hmm. Should have parked that suck in the driveway and kept my little happy hips at home. But I presumably drove out, taking authority, praying, covering it, the blood of Jesus, rebuking, binding, casting out, doing everything I could do to get my protection from God. Mm -hmm. It took me five years going back and forth with every once in a while. I said, Lord, that's the only thing in my life. I never understood why you did. I wasn't mad at him, but I was disappointed and befuddled. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't figure that one out. The Lord finally, after five years of rehashing that bad boy, he just blew the whole thing on a scenario for me. In about three or five seconds, I had the whole concept. And I said, whoa, I was wrong all along. I was the one that was wrong. I didn't see it, but I saw it when the Lord showed it to me. He said, all this and that happened and that happened. I'm breaking it down real quick. I'm not going into detail. This happened, that happened, the other happened. And you saw this, you felt that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he said, I did everything I could to stop you from taking the car on the road. But when you presumably got out there on your prayer and on your authority and decided you were going to drive by faith, when I never told you to get out there and do anything, I warned you. You went against my warning and it happened. Not because I just let it happen but because you stepped out from under the ark of safety. Your ark of safety was parking that car, going by the warnings I had been giving you all day long. And those three close calls you had. So when he told me that, I boohooed and asked God to forgive me. I realized right then it was all my fault. And God still took care of me. I, he gave me extra money to catch a cab here and there. And it was inconvenient, but I made it by just fine. And then later on, he blessed me with a car. But the bottom line is it was lesson learned. Some of us, are we commit presumptuous sins. And we don't realize that that is what brought about that consequence and that consequence and that problem. And, 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 and oh my goodness, or the one we love may have committed a presumptuous sin that we don't know about because God doesn't have to come back and check in with us. Be sovereign. And then there are times it's just their time and he wants them in heaven with him. And oh well, he created them. They belong to him. That's between him and them, not you. It's difficult to think that way. But in spite of all of that, y'all, God is good and God is love. Mm -hmm. Now, Let's go on to the next thing that happened. <laughs> We're going to 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm trying to go fast because I want to hear what Lynette has to say. Okay. Uh, and you guys got to stay tuned for her because I'll probably upload hers first. I know that's going to be powerful. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Ha! Ah! Time for correction. Time for reckoning. We don't like when the Lord takes us to the woodshed. Now, I knew my father loved me, my human father. I knew my father was for me, not against me. He protected me. He taught me. Oh, my goodness. That man was a phenomenal father. But he also pulled that belt off his belt buckle and laid me across his knee after explaining in detail why. I was going to get this booty whooping and tore my behind up. But I was not one to do pain. So once I paid the penalty, that crime didn't happen anymore. Some of y'all wonder why your kid's are out of control. Because you won't handle them. You think spanking them isn't love. The Bible sanctions spanking for your information. Moving right along. <laughs> Now, here we are with David. He commits a crime. He commits the ultimate crime. He sees a woman. When he should have been out at war with his men, he's at home checking out this fine 
brick house down there on the roof, taking herself a little bath, right? And he happens to be checking out the wife of his most dedicated army leader, U U Uzziah. I remember now. Okay, Uzziah. Thank you, Lord. So Uzziah has got this beautiful wife. Uzziah is on the front lines battling for David, laying his life on the line for his king. He wouldn't even go home half the time. He'd sleep where his king was to make sure he could be his bodyguard or whatever he had to do. He wanted to be at his king's beck and call because he was that dedicated. And when David got a look at what he was married to, he said, oh, I know how to handle this. He said, I'm going to get that out of my way. So he, psst, Come over here. And he orders them to position Uzziah on the most dangerous part, guaranteeing his death. He wanted Uzziah dead, not because he wanted Uzziah to die. He wanted Uzziah out of the way so he could get that wife. That's right. So he gives his wife a month to mourn because Uzziah is dead now. And now he gets to marry Miss Thang. Right. Check it out. Check it out. I want to share this with you. David loved God. David was intimate with God. He was a man after God's own heart. He was his friend. They were tight, thick as thieves. David and his Lord, which many of you could use a little bit of that part of intimacy with God. And because David had that relationship with God, God was able to send a prophet, Nathan, to David. Nathan tells him a story, paints a picture of a man who was rich with goods and all of that, and he's taken from the man who only has one thing in his name. And David is all indignant. He says, oh, let's get to him. I'm making it quick because I want to get to Lynette's message. Listen. Uh, he says, oh, well, that's horrible. How can he do that to a person? Bring him. I'll have his head cut off or whatever he said. He was all indignant, righteous indignation. So he thought. Nathan looked at him and he said, the Lord says, you are that man. And David's like, what? What, what do they do? What do they do? And he breaks it down to him. Your faithful servant, Uzziah. You had him killed so you could have a piece of meat that belonged to him, his wife, his soulmate. But no, 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 no. You got all these concubines. You got all these wives the Lord blessed you with. And the Lord said, that wasn't enough. You had to take that man's one wife. What's up with that? That's all he had. And you had to take that. You had to take his life. And then you had to take what was, oh. So David was beside himself in conviction. He was sorry. He loved God. He knew God was right. He knew he was wrong. He repented before God. And check it out. Here's the reckoning part that we don't like about God. It was prophesied that he'd have a son. And that son was going to die. He wasn't going to get the joy of watching his son grow. Because when that woman became his wife and gave birth to his child, God was not going to let David be blessed by a sin like that. So he snatched that blessing out of their life. And he prophesied a lot of stuff was going to go down in his house. And some of his wives were going to be very, very unfaithful to him because of what he did to Uzziah. See, God, he when he says vengeance is mine, I will repay. He means it. Now, even though he and God were thick, God handled what he did to Uzziah. Nobody probably paid any attention to Uzziah, but guess what? God did. God said, no, you're not going to do that to this man. As loyal and faithful as he is, God vindicated him. Now, listen, listen to this. David, time went on, the woman got pregnant, she gave birth, 
the baby was sick. David fasted in dust and ashes and would not eat a thing, begging God to spare that boy's life. Check this out. This is a lesson you guys got to learn in relationship when it comes to God and his sovereignty. Five or seven days later, whatever the case was, almost a week later, the servants came to him. They, they couldn't make him eat. He would not touch a thing. And they, they finally, he could see the countenance on them. And he says, uh, my son died, didn't he? He, he? Yes, he did. Okay. So now that he knew his son was dead, he cleaned himself up, took a bath, got dressed, and went on to sit down and get himself a meal. And they're still looking at him like, wait a minute. Your son was on death's bed, on, at death's door. You wouldn't need a thing. Now your son died and you're eating? And he said, what's the point of not eating? He says, I was hoping that God might change his mind. I'm breaking it down. Real loose, real loose uh, description. I was hoping that, that I could convince God to change his mind and have mercy on me. But, you know, God had his way in the whirlwind. And guess what? I don't have a son and I'm hungry. So, yeah, I'm going to eat. There's no need not to eat now. He gone. He did it. So he never said a mumbling word against God, did he? He never got angry with God, did he? No. No. He didn't question God's judgment, did he? No. He knew he was wrong. He knew what he did. And when he finally reckoned with it, he said, okay, the Lord have his way in my life. Even in punishment, he trusted God and loved him nonetheless. What about you? Hmm. Well, see, that's why I say, and I'm going to end with this. You need to be close to God. You need to know that he loves you and constantly ask him to reveal it to you until you experience it. There is nothing that happens on the face of this planet. It may make you question why he did this or why he did that, but it won't make you question him. You will know that you know that you know that he loves you. He's for you. He's with you. He'll never leave you. But he will deal with you when you're wrong. And love, that's what you call tough love. That's the tough love side of God. But we don't want to acknowledge. We want to think he's warm and fuzzy like a little teddy bear. He smells good. He talks good. He is good. He's cute. He's nice and he's handy to have along. He's like a good luck charm. But you don't want to think about the wrath of God. And God's got that side. Well, see, all of that comes with intimacy with God. You commit a sin one time too many and you start feeling his wrath. You back up off that sin real quick, don't you? Yeah, you don't get mad at him for being mad at you. You thank him for letting you know that your behind is about to be raked over the coal if you don't stop. You stop in time, your blessings continue. God bless you. I hope that encourages you to draw near because when you draw near God and you recognize his love and you see the proof of his love in your life, you can stand assured that he's trustworthy no matter what. God bless you.